Stone Brothers Production. Welcome back, everyone. Sorry on the delay of this video. Been busy with an artwork for a game, but this will be the five serial killers in Colorado. So let's begin. Number five, Anna Marie Hahn. Hahn was born in a town of Fusen in Bavaria, Germany, to George and Katharina Filser. She was the youngest of 12 children, nine of them being boys. At the time of Anna Marie's birth, her parents had lost three children and two of their boys were killed in action during World War I. She strayed away from her parents, though through her teenage years she was used to getting her own way. She was known to sneak out of the house and go out late night parties. She never finished high school, but would later claim that she graduated from teaching school. Han was so rebellious, she was kicked out to live with her sister, so she can help out straighten out her disciplinary problems. Anna gave birth to her first son around the age of 18 to a father who was not in the picture. She soon then leaves America while her son, Oscar, stays with Anna Marie's mother's care in Germany for the first three years of his life, where she waited two years for her visa. She then aborted SS München to New York, where she falls ill with the scarlet fever for three weeks. Anna landed a job as a stay-at-home nurse while lying to Charles Oswald, stating she worked as a nurse and would like to work for him and his home. Her actions landed him the intention in Charles's eyes that he wanted to marry her one day. To then Anna replies she has no intention to actually follow through with the marriage. She then began to steal money from Charles and gambled earning first place enough to earn cash to stay on her own and landing herself a job at 500 Broom Hotel Alms. She met her future husband Philip Hahn, a telegrapher for Western Union. Then married him in Buffalo, New York to be able to bring her son down to America where they then moved into a construction home in Cincinnati. She then later in the future began down a road of multiple crimes, including stealing 27 shares of Union Gas and electric from Oswald, forging checks, and stealing prescription pads from a sick doctor she rented rooms from a name Ernest Kohler. Dr. Kohler was sick at the time but thought up that Anna poisoned him later ruled to have had throat cancer. Around the age of 26 to her incarceration, she started a crime spree, forging many documents to get life insurance policies from more of her victims. All of the victims being elderly victims to get a nice and easy explanation to the cops that their bad health is how they died. Later her luck caught up to her when various victims that had died to her clutches had their possessions stolen. Investigators found out that Anna had a bad gambling habit. That eventually hinted investigators to pursue where she had been and gathered information from other key witnesses. They finally had a break when an attempt on Jorge Obendofer happened where unfortunately he died. She gave him a drink where he saw flies land in and die in his drink, instantly giving him the state in mind that it was poisoned. Unfortunately, he was paralyzed from other attempts in his food while en route to Colorado by train. Her son testified that the man fell ill while in her care, and an autopsy results revealed high levels of arsenic in Oben Dofer's body, which arose police suspicion. They also examined her other clients, revealing that they also had been poisoned, and Anna pled to them that she did not poison all the men in her care, but she was sick in the head at the time. She pleaded, No, 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 Mr. Woodward. Mr. Woodward, don't do this to me. Won't someone help me? When they sentenced her to death in an electric chair in Ohio, which made her the first woman in Ohio's history to die in an electric chair on December 7th, 1938. Number 4. Scott Lee Kimball Kimball was born in Boulder, Colorado, and grew up in Lafayette, Colorado, leaving Colorado in his high school years to follow his father up to Montana after his parents' divorce. Scott lived throughout several states throughout most of his early adult life. Eventually, he moved back with his mother after agreeing to convince the FBI that he can help with catching ecstasy operation in the Denver area. Scott convinced them because he was inside Montana prison for other various charges, which included theft. He also bragged about being like Hannibal after the serial killer from the Thomas Harris novels. He bragged about living as a hitman through his early years. Little did cops know he was actually murdering people, especially women, 
but the authorities did not know about him because he made himself scheme to tell them. He convinced them a murder for hire plot that involved his former cellmate Steve Ennis and that his cellmate's girlfriend Jennifer Markham, which police would acquire she befriended Scott. The FBI agreed on Scott's proposal on helping them and becoming involved because of the possibility of murder for hire scenarios. Markham, it turned out, had been a potential witness in a Drug Enforcement Administration methamphetamine case against Ennis, and Ennis allegedly wanted another potential witness against him killed and made plans to use Markham to get the job done. Before the year ended, Kimball's plan had worked and he was back in the streets, minimal, supervised. Within a few months of Kimball's release, Jennifer Markham disappeared. Then Scott's uncle, Terry Kimball, along with Casey McLeod of Lafayette, Colorado, and Leanne Emery, age 24, of Aurora, Colorado, went missing too. Before the investigation of this twisted case was all over, authorities would learn that Scott Kimball had married Lori McLeod, the unsuspecting mother of Casey McLeod, in Las Vegas, Nevada, Shortly out of getting out of prison, the newlyweds spent their honeymoon camping in the area where Casey's remains would eventually be found. He was caught and arrested for violation of his condition of his release and was back in jail on various charges. An inmate with a former cellmate bruising on November 2006 took place where he told them everything about Kimball as he was worried about his own life. He stated that he figured out he was a killer and he wasn't going anywhere with them. He said he figured he'd be dead if he did, which he stated to ABC News. Eventually, he and the detectives had gathered enough evidence after a few years to make an arrest on all four counts of murder, even though the number can be higher than anticipated. Eventually, Kimball was allowed to plead guilty on two counts of second-degree murder and the deaths of Terry Kimball and Jennifer Merkham, Leanne Emery, and Casey McLeod in part so that the victim's families could have some semblance of closure. One of the counts pertained to Terry Kimball's murder, and the second count pertained to the murders of Markham, Emery, and McLeod. As part of the plea bargain, Kimball had also agreed to assist authorities in locating his victim's remains. Kimball was sentenced to 70 years in prison for his guilty pleas to second-degree murder, theft, and other various charges. Number 3 Robert Spangler Spangler was born in Des Moines, Iowa on January 10, 1933 to parents that were not known to him and he was adopted at a very young age by Merlin Spangler and Ione Spangler in Amnes, Iowa. Robert had always been called Bob for short and he couldn't have been adopted by a prominent and caring Iowa family at the time but the mere fact that he was adopted made him always wonder who his real parents were. Bob, as I will refer to as Robert for short. He lived in a competitive atmosphere during his early life and started on his high school football team and had an amazing season. Spangler's father had a great reputation as a professor at Iowa State in the field of soil engineering while guiding his son on a successful future, and he did just that. He graduated from MS High School and then moved on to graduate from Iowa State with a degree in technical journalism. During Spangler's early years, various sources stated that he might have been suspected to a murderer of a classmate that he did not like, and this will be his early stages of his sadistic actions that will carry on to his older age. He had his first two children with Nancy Spangler, his son named David and daughter Susan. During his first 10 to 13 years, he was loyal to his wife, and then he begins a secret affair with Sharon Cooper, who was a co-worker. He then moved in with Sharon and soon after moved back in with his family and then devised a plan to convince his wife about a surprise downstairs where he had shot her in the head with a 38 handgun. He then ran up the stairs to shut his children up by shooting them both. Unfortunately, his son died slowly when Robert smothered him with a pillow. He cleverly shaped the crime scene making it appear that his wife had shot her children then herself after leaving a fake typewritten suicide note, and then the gun's position was perfectly in no other signs of a struggle. He then moved on to his new love, Sharon Cooper, who was a former high school athlete that he loved to hike with and was short-lived. The marriage ended in a costly divorce of $500 per month, including other monthly charges for said amounts of years. 
Another odd thing is that his wife Sharon died of an overdose, and he was by her side at her death to play it off even more so, and receiving $20,000 for her death, no longer having to pay her for the divorce settlements. A time later, he met a 59-year-old aerobics instructor, Donna Suttling, in the late 1980s. Robert married her and moved to a new home in Durango, Colorado, where he lands a job at a country music station as a morning personality and soon becomes very popular. He soon starts to be displeased with Donna as his third wife and convinces her to go for a nice hike at the Grand Canyon. There he waits for her to get a nice close-up by the cliff. Where no one was around, he waits for her, and then he pushes her off the Grand Canyon, falling miles down to her death. Bob rushed to the ranger station and persuaded officers that his wife had fallen to her death. He stated that they had stopped on a trail to take a rest and a few pictures at the same time he turned around and she vanished. He had gotten lucky with both in early 1976 for murdering his family and in 1993, but tides had turned in the investigation. Victim's families knew about Sharon and Robert, had family issues in 1976 with cheating and all. Robert married her and moved to a new home in Durango, Colorado, where he lands a job in a country music station. While Donna, in 1993, having a fear of heights and knowing she gets skittish going on the edge of any high structure, soon enough, investigators caught a break with the emails and finally receiving enough confessions from Spangler about the details of the murders. He even told investigators about killing his wife with gunshots from a 38 to the head and then his daughter in the back and then his son in the chest while having him smothered with a pillow. He even went on to describe sheer easiness to murder his third wife. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole in Arizona in 2000 and died the next year in prison on August 5th, 2001. Number two, Vincent Durrell Groves. Groves was born in 1953 not much is known on his early life from research, although Groves starred in a championship Colorado basketball team in the 1972 state title game, said Bert Borgman, assistant commissioner of the Colorado High School Activities Association. Later, he stocked Colfax Avenue Corridor, an area historically known for prostitutes and different jobs, also took him to locations throughout the Denver area, Yearling said. He soon began to be a pimp and lead down a terrible path that he could not stop. Groves' path involved murder, although police really caught on with his first murdered victim involved, which was his former girlfriend in 1981, to which he confessed to. Groves committed this homicide by strangling the young woman after they had ingested cocaine and he engaged in sexual intercourse. Although this is not his first victim, because he started his slings back in 1978 until 1987 or 1988. One of his last victims that got away was a hitchhiker he mistaken for a prostitute that he had picked up and drove her to a remote area to drink, then threatened to stab her while gagging her with a sock and tried to rape her, but she escaped to a nearby car. Soon enough, on September 1st, 1988, he was arrested for an Aurora prostitute that went missing for a year and held on a $1 million bond pending by the official filing of charges by the Denver District Attorney's Office. While in incarceration for eight years, he died and was only convicted of two deaths before his death in prison. Before his death in prison, detectives asked him to share the fate of his victims, but he refused. After his death, they linked over 17 bodies and counting up past that. Most of his victims were strangled, raped, or burned to death and tortured with kits like knives and ties. Denver district attorneys think that Groves was killing over two women a month. People believed he was the most prolific serial killer in the state of Colorado and believed they will link him to even more victims. Number one, Felipe Espinosa. Espinosa was born around 1832 and he's the son of Pedro Espinosa and Maria Chavez at San Juan Nepo Nuceno de El Rito, New Mexico. Though some sources stated different cities like that of Veracruz and Rio Arriba County. Born first to a family of five siblings, he despised the new laws after a Mexican-American war. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which ended the Mexican-American War, 
stipulated that New Mexicans would keep their property rights, but this was not the case for many landowners. Instead, some entrepreneurial Americans implemented a process of chicanery and manipulation of the system that caused the Hispanic people to lose two-thirds of their common lands to the new conquerors. This happened to Felipe in such a terrible way that he lost enough land to not able to provide for his family. So Felipe and his wife Soconina Hurtado moved to the area of Conejos, Colorado to settle in the town of San Rafael. They also had witnessed the killings of six family members when their town was shelled by the U.S. Navy during the Mexican-American War. It was then that he and his brother Jose Vivian robbed freight trains and stole horses because of reasonings of poverty and desperation in their current state which becomes their way of life for the next couple of years. Unfortunately for the duo, in early 1863 both Espinosa and his brother robbed a freight wagon that belonged to a priest and the wagon was driven by a team from Conejos area. This has caused them to be recognized by the team drivers, which caused them to have a military detachment to be sent to their house for an arrest, but a gunfight ensued, leaving the army corporal dead, which changed their charges to murder. The Espinosa brothers escaped and fled to the Sangre de Cristo Mountains as police had taken the stolen money from previous robberies. This left the brothers in pure hate to see their family in distress without means of basic survival. In turn, the brothers declared war and death to all Anglos and set out on a campaign to avenge their family and people by killing as many Americanos as they could. They had murdered up to 20 or more people. Sources on the number varied from article to article, but they were known to have taken out their heads of their victims, hacking it out of their chests in a brutal fashion. At this time, they were known as the Bloody Espinosas. Espinosa also sent a letter to Governor John Evans, threatening to kill 600 gringos, including the governor, if he and other members of the gang were not granted amnesty, and some 500 acres in Conejos County, Colorado. The cause of this had the governor sent upon U.S. Calvary to help track down the Bloody Espinosas which left Jose being killed at their camp in the early morning of May 9th of 1863. Felipe evidently escaped to San Rafael for some time, which he had always stayed hiding and cautious of his surroundings. This leads him to convince his nephew Jose Vicente to help him, but eventually the duo were both shot, killed, and beheaded, ending their campaign of vengeance upon the people of Colorado and various states. The cause of 32 American lives was lost of the deceptiveness of the treaty and left an impact that is still known to this day. They considered the Espinosa brothers the first serial killers in the United States, leaving Felipe as the mastermind. I hope you enjoyed the video. The next off video, which will be the final video in this series, should be up by early next week I'm shooting for, so stay tuned for that. And the next Serial Killer series, I'm shooting for maybe later next week. So uh, stay tuned and have a good day.